innovation was considered a wheel, then change would be its axle. And change, as we know it, is inevitable. Thus, today is the wheel of innovation, invention, and most importantly, creative thinking. In fact, it's probably the only thing in perpetual motion which does not violate the laws of thermodynamics. Nerd joke is supposed to laugh. <laughs> Contrary to common misconception, innovating doesn't necessarily involve making something new all the time. You could reinvent the wheel in a dozen ways, each time with a different approach to exactly the same problem. Experimenting with a plethora of seemingly useless techniques also has its benefits. Because in learning how something does not work, as ridiculous as it may sound, it is useful for figuring out the way it does. And one more way that it does not. So you've heard of that thing with the light bulb, and it's did it 1,000 times before you figured out that it worked. Common story? Yes, you've heard of it. You probably don't remember. Yes. <laughs> so, in fixing a problem, not only do we discover one more way to make it work, but also one more way in which it does not. Now, occasionally, we've all run into that person who very magnanimously prescribes the kickstart treatment to stalling bikes, stalling inkjet printers, stalling washing machines, all in equal measure. And at that point of time, maybe it works. Most of the time, it does work. Occasionally, it doesn't. But does this really resolve the problem at its source? Do you think it does? I don't think so. And that is the primary reason why you and I were born into a world that thirsts for constructive innovation. Novelty in the process of ideation beyond the limitations of conventional methods. In fact, this reminds me of an experience I had at Quark in 2016. Quark is the annual technical festival of the Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Goa campus. I was in the 8th standard, participating in it for the third time. It was the second day, and the first round of the line following competition. Could we have the next slide, please? The next one. The objective was pretty simple. Design and build a robot that can follow this path shown here. It was a track width of 3 centimeters, black line printed on a white background, and quite obviously, the robot which would complete the path in the shortest possible time would be declared the winner. Now, that sounds quite okay, right? I mean, how bad could it get? Hear me out. Based on two previous years of participation in the very same competition, I already had a rough idea of what I was going to do, which involved using a PID algorithm to navigate the longer sections of this path with certain special cases for sharp turns, intersections, junctions, discontinuous lines, and other obstacles that they could put in between. Before going ahead with this, a brief on what PID is. It's an acronym for Proportional Integral Derivative. Now, if you look, Google for it, you'll get this. Control loop feedback mechanism for systems requiring continuously modulated control, blah, 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 blah. That's the Wikipedia definition. Nothing that complicated. It simply measures the difference between a desired target value, that's called the set point, and the actual value received from the sensors called the process variable. It measures the difference and consequently sends a signal to the robot's motor movement, correcting its subsequent motion along the line. So in this case, those three equations, the proportional, integral, and derivative, would correct the movement of the robot every time it steered away from the line, putting it back on course. You get that? So, when the track for round one was unveiled before the participants, we were in for a very rude shock. The track width was not three centimeters, it was four. Now you're probably thinking, what's the big deal? One extra centimeter. How bad can it get? One extra centimeter for a sensor that is the length of your index finger means one extra sensor. And one extra sensor covering the line also means that there's an alteration in the special cases for the code. Now, I thought exactly this, and when the time came to alter that program, I just made a few changes here and there, temporary fixes, and I gave both my trials for round one successively. How do you think it went? It was the worst performance ever. Okay, that, that kind of performance had never been seen before at the competition. 
the light followers spun in circles like a cat chasing its tail, a blind cat chasing its tail, if I may say so. And it did not so much as sniff the finishing line, let alone even going close to it. So I returned home, a little dejected, home and joking, very dejected, and began adjusting every possible parameter in that program, going to the extent of fiddling with the previously calibrated PID constants, the KP, KI, and KD variables. And after a very late dinner, several exasperating hours later, I decided to hell with the standard PID format. I'm not going to follow this. It's not working anyway. And at 1 a.m. in the morning, I changed the very equations on which the entire algorithm was based. Testing it only once before turning in for the night, I didn't have any great expectations. I vaguely remember it working a little bit better than before, but still not competition worthy. The next day, serendipitously, I figured out that all 24 participating teams had qualified to round 2. Why? Everyone had the same problem. So, the first trial ended with a few incorrect judgments at the accurate angle turns, which I tried correcting before my second attempt during round two. To cut a long story short, I finished the track, but with five penalties, adding 25 extra seconds to a total run time of 38 seconds. So, with 63 seconds on the score sheet, very low expectations, and the end of the day drawing close, I Walked out of the room, packed up my stuff, went to the canteen to fetch me a snack. Believe it or not, that year, an A standard student won the second place at that line following competition. It taught me an invaluable lesson. When changing the parameters don't work, change the equation, alter the obvious. Invention, innovation, and novelty rely on shifting these paradigms when they cease to function. Not simply providing a temporary bug fix, but changing the entire approach to tackle the problem at its roots. Do we have opportunities for this? Definitely. No scientific system, however well engineered, is flawless. There's always scope for improvisation and improvement. And herein lies a chance for disruptive innovation to raise its head. Trying something that's never been attempted before. Something that's totally out of the box. Something that makes people laugh first and think later. Throwing their lives into high gear with its benefits. That is real, constructive, progressive, and disruptive innovation. No machine is infallible, but however much anyone tries, progressive innovation is the one machine that just isn't designed to break down. There have been several times in the past when not just technology, but science as a whole seemed to stumble beyond a point of no return. But each and every time, creative human minds the world over broke through these shackles with renewed vigor completely revolutionizing science on an unfathomable scale. And that continues to happen till date. And I'm sure it will in the future with all of you here. With new avenues opening up in big data analytics, the internet of things, cloud computing, blockchain technology, the list, will, the list is endless. The quantum of gray areas between these fields has also multiplied manifold. An innovator's work is never done. And it is these opportunities that have opened up even more scope to every single one of us here. It's almost analogous to playing a game with an indefinite number of levels, each one more complicated and far more exciting than the one preceding it. Ever since the dawn of the information age, pop culture has been ranting and raving. You know, the AI revolution is coming. And for the last decade or so, I've only heard folks reiterating, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, you know what? It's here. Right here, right now. Yes, the AI revolution that Western pop culture was so infatuated with is right here, right now. It entered our lives in the least dramatic manner possible without that long-promised self-awareness apocalypse. 
I was almost disappointed about that. At some point or the other, we've all heard of this phenomenon, popularized primarily by science fiction films. But I'd like you all to take a moment, step back, and think about the whole thing very rationally. It's not just AI, but any form of technology is a double-edged sword. How one wields it, that's what makes a world of difference. So far, I'd say we're doing jolly well, based on what we have, the technology we've developed, it's within controllable limits. So far, so good. Besides, you also have to consider the fact that Hollywood makes its money scaring the pants off its audience. On a more serious note, the manner in which we choose to utilize our knowledge, that's a decision that all of us have faced or will face in the coming years. This, friends, is the reason why I reiterate before you that not merely innovation, but constructive innovation is the need of the hour. Every single one of us here is part of a, is a vital constituent of a great body of knowledge that has built up through the ages. And it is our moral duty to ensure that this invaluable information gained from years and years of evolutionary experience is not just left behind in the dust, but passed on in its entirety. As Dr. Soyce once put it well, and I quote, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the one. Innovators, I wish you all the best for your future endeavors. Thank you for having me.